Tony, this is, I think, what we were looking for. I want to take a moment and discuss Sennacherib's prism, a hexagonal clay item that was inscribed with cuneiform writing about 15 inches tall. There's actually three of them. There's the Taylor prism, uh, there's the Oriental Institute prism, and then there's the one Jerusalem prism, which was just recently translated. These three are virtually identical. They're six-sided uh, prisms made out of clay inscribed with cuneiform writing detailing the years of Sennacherib's time when he invaded into the West. When his father Sargon died, uh, Sennacherib took over in 705 BC of the Assyrian Empire. There's a lot of unrest. The death of Sargon indicated that the gods were upset with him and his dynasty, and so people began to riot or rebel throughout his empire. Sennacherib realized that he had to show a, a sign of force to prove that he was indeed in control and the gods were on his side. Very important in this whole battle scene is to demonstrate to the culture of that time that the gods were showing you favor. And so by conquering, obviously the gods were on your side. To lose in battle, the gods were against you for some reason. So Sennacherib moved out east, secured that side of his empire, and then turned west. He was very violent and very aggressive. The Assyrians were impaling people, uh, cutting off hands and feet. We've got in, uh, detailed inscriptions of this in the uh, in the Lachish battle. We'll look at that here next. Okay, they're very violent, wicked people. If you rebelled, they they were merciless. And so as he came down into the western side, coming down through Syria, down through Phoenicia, down the coast towards Judah, Israel had already been taken some 15 years before by the Assyrians. So the northern tribes of Israel and Samaria had already been taken under their control. But they came down towards Phoenicia. All the coastal cities opened their gates, welcomed them, because they did not want to face the wrath of Sennacherib and his Assyrian forces. But uh, the couple of the Philistine cities, uh, Ekron, Gaza, and then Judah, under Hezekiah's leadership, Judah and Jerusalem rebelled, said, we're not going to submit, we're not going to pay tribute. Well, that just gave uh, Sennacherib the opportunity to demonstrate his power. After having conquered the Philistines, he moved in to take out some 40, 46 cities, villages, including the fortress cities of Judah. He took uh, Lachish. Uh, that's a great monument to that battle was in his, uh, inscribed in his palace on the walls. Now, uh, what takes place is very unique, very interesting. As he's finishing up his battle in Lachish, he begins to put pressure on Hezekiah in Jerusalem, wanting Hezekiah to submit, and Hezekiah has refused. As we read the scriptures, Isaiah was encouraging him to trust Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Judah, over the gods of all the Assyrians. So there was a, a, a power battle here of whose god was the greatest. Hezekiah, of course, was scared. Many of the kings had backed down. But at this time, as he began to approach, Sennacherib began to approach uh, uh, Jerusalem. He'd sent forces down into Egypt and had had a battle there. But he's now going to make his move on Jerusalem after the Lachish battle. Again, total destruction of Lachish. Archaeological evidence indicates that very clearly. The palace walls indicate the, the victory at Lachish. Uh, but on the Hezekiah prism, or the Sennacherib prism, uh, located in three different areas, uh, recorded in three different prisms, the, the, the uh, Taylor prism in the British Museum, the Oxford uh, Museum, they've got the Oriental Institute prism, and then the third one, the Jerusalem prism, all saying virtually the same thing. For some reason, Sennacherib backed off and simply returned back to Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh, and accepted tribute. He records in boasting fashion the, uh, 
tremendous amount of tribute he received from Hezekiah, mentioning Hezekiah by name several times, including uh, his, the name of the city and all the tribute. But he makes it very clear that he never took Jerusalem. In fact, he turned back from Jerusalem. Now, the question needs to be asked, and has been asked for, you know, some 2,500 years. Why did Sennacherib not finish the destruction of Judah? All the cities were laid waste, the fortified cities had fallen, and the only thing that was left was Jerusalem. And then all Judea would have been his. But for some reason, he stopped short of overthrowing Hezekiah, the rebel king, and goes back to Nineveh. Now, the Bible gives a reason. It's the, the angel of the Lord went out and, and laid waste 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrians. This was after Isaiah and Hezekiah had prayed. Uh, they'd gone and sought Yahweh. And Yahweh had given a prophecy to Isaiah for Hezekiah that an arrow will not be shot in Jerusalem. And indeed, it took place that very night. Now, also recording this is Herodotus, the Greek historian, right, right around 400 A.D., he records that mice had gotten in and chewed up all of the fabric and had some kind of a disease and, and the soldiers died. Josephus, trying to make sense of this, ties again some kind of divine interference that the, the Assyrian soldiers were destroyed and Sennacherib headed back north. Now, what's unique about the story is this is not just a biblical story. This is a story that's recorded by the Greek historian it's recorded in the writings of the Assyrians on several locations, including the palace walls and including on this prism that we're discussing. And it gives the details that indeed, although Assyria makes it sound and Sennacherib makes it sound like he had totally dominated Hezekiah, the fact that he let him stay in power and Sennacherib left the country is not the message he wanted to send to the world at that time. He conquered east. He'd conquered west. He'd come down the coast. He laid waste all of Judah. But when he got to Jerusalem, he tucked tail and headed back to Nineveh. Without the biblical account, that is what happened historically. That is what happened according to the prisms that record these events in his own words. Now, of course, he's going to tell his side of the story. Oh, I got a lot of tribute. I brought a lot of people back with me. But listen, why did you not destroy Jerusalem? Why did you not replace Hezekiah? Why did you leave the rebel Hezekiah in power and you go back home and hide in your palace? Something happens, even according to the writings of himself, the Sennacherib, the Assyrian, on his own documents, in his own cuneiform inscriptions. Something happens according to the Greek historian. Something happens according to Josephus. And something definitely happens according to the writings of Amos, uh, or excuse me, Micah, Isaiah, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. So it appears uh, there was some kind of divine intervention. We have an example of some of the things uh, the Assyrians would do, for example, right out of their own documents. I built a pillar over against the city gate, and I flayed all the chief men who had revolted. And I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled up on the pillar on stakes. And I cut off the limbs of the officers of the royal officials who had rebelled. This would be something that Hezekiah would expect to take place if he rebelled, if he lost the battle. And by backing off of leaving Hezekiah there, this is exactly the propaganda that Sennacherib did, want, did not want let loose in his empire. Another one, many captives from among them I burned with fire, and many I took as living captives. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers. Of many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of living and another of heads. And I bound their heads to the posts, the tree trunks, around about the city. Their young men and maidens I burned into fire. Twenty men I captured alive, and I immured them in the wall of his palace. The rest of them, the warriors, I consumed with thirst in the desert of the Euphrates. That is a couple things that recorded on their monuments of what they did to people that they conquered. Now, for some reason, Sennacherib believes, and this is what Herodotus records in his writings on what took place. He says, during the night, a horde of field mice gnawed quivers and their bows and the handles of shields with the result that many were killed. 
fleeing unarmed the next day. That is what takes place. That's why Sennacherib, according to Herodotus, the Greek historian, never went into battle in Jerusalem. He, he backed off and left Judah there with Hezekiah. Uh, Josephus, writing around 90 AD, writes, When Sennacherib returned to Jerusalem from the war with Egypt, he also had a battle front going on with the Egyptians, he found there the force of Rapshak in danger from the plague. So he records there was a plague. Herodotus says there were mice came in, chewed up all the leather, all the bowstrings. Uh, Josephus records that there was a plague brought on possibly by these mice. For God had visited a pestilent sickness upon his army, and on the first night of the siege, 185,000 men had perished with their commanders and officers. And Sennacherib then returns back. Just like his monuments say, just like the... Uh, the three prisms that record identically the information, the prism of uh, uh, the Taylor prism from the British Museum, the Oriental Institute prism, and the Jerusalem prism, all saying the same thing on the six-sided face of the hexagon with paragraphs on each side, fully inscribed the writings of this detail. Something interesting happened. Here's a sample of that picture right there of the prism. Here's examples of all three of them I'm referring to right there. And we'll take a look at some of the things I looked at in the British Museum, and we look at the inscriptions. I do want to read to you very quickly the inscription that is written on these three pillars uh, referring to Hezekiah and what took place. Has, again, Sennacherib, after destroying all of Judea, including Lachish, the last of the fortified cities before Jerusalem, he approaches Jerusalem, threatens Jerusalem, and then overnight heads back to Nineveh and doesn't finish the siege. Here it is. This is what he writes when he gets back on this pillar, boasting the most he can about all the tribute he got, but at the end of the day, he never took Jerusalem. He never overthrew Hezekiah, although he had taken all the other cities and overthrown all the other kings. He writes, As for Hezekiah the Judite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, by leveling with battering rams, and by bringing up siege engines, and by attacking and storming on foot, by mines, tunnels, and breaches, I besieged and took them. 200,150 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, and sheep, without number, I brought away from them and counted as spoil. Hezekiah himself... Like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up earthworks against him. The one coming out of the city gate, I turned back to his misery. His cities, which I had despoiled, I cut off from his, his land. And to Metini, the king of Ashdod, Padi, king of Ekron, and Silabi, the king of Gaza, I gave them. And thus I diminished his land. I added to the former tribute, and I laid upon him the surrender of their land, impost gifts for my majesty. As for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendor of my majesty overcame him. And the Arabs and his mercenary troops, which he had brought in to strengthen Jerusalem, his royal city, deserted him. In addition to the 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, gems and antimony, jewels and large car carnelians, the... Uh, Ivory inlaid couches, ivory inlaid chairs, elephant hides, elephant tusk, ebony, box with all kinds of valuable treasures, as well as his daughters, his harem, his male and female musicians, which he had brought after me to Nineveh, my royal city. To pay tribute and to accept servitude, he dispatched his messengers. Very impressive, Sennacherib, but why didn't you take the city? Why didn't you overthrow Hezekiah? Why did you leave him there in the city with the temple intact and the worship of Yahweh still functioning?